All right, this Christmas we are in Matthew chapter 2, and we are going to particularly look at verses 1 and 2 of the text that was part of our Bible reading this morning. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, let me remind you of what the Word of God says there. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now the scriptures present uh, the birth of Christ as a humbling of himself according to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. It says in that verse that he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, the death of the cross. And the scripture goes on to explain that he made himself of no reputation by taking the form of a slave, by coming in the likeness of a man. So he wasn't adding to himself by becoming man. He, he was actually, this was part of his humility, to, be, to come as man even though he is God. So he was born in that kind of humility. He was born in an animal stable. Even, even the way that he was born and where he was born uh, really connects with the idea of humility. They laid him in a feeding trough for animals. I mean, we've kind of glamorized it with our nativity scenes uh, today, but this was not a, a glamorous thing. It would have been something that would have been a hardship, especially for his mother. He was wrapped in cloth, the, the Bible tells us, more likely used again for the animals, uh, perhaps to wipe them down after the day that, that they've been out. Uh, it wouldn't have been a very uh, easy thing on the family. Humanly speaking, no one would look at what's happening when it comes to the birth of Christ and say, this is really a serious contender for the birth of the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Nobody would have been saying something like that at the time that Jesus was born. In fact, people were very apathetic about the coming of Messiah. As we learn, uh, Herod, the Jewish people are apathetic about it, but Herod himself, the only thing that he's concerned is about, uh, is about this idea of a rival king. But there was more than just the humility, right? I mean, there were elements of the supernatural that attended the birth of Christ as well. The Bible tells us that an angel choir split the sky so that the shepherds were looking up at the sky and they were hearing this angelic choir sing glory to God in the highest because of the birth of Christ. Just the idea of prophecy being fulfilled after 400 years of silence is a, a supernatural wonder in and of itself. I mean, think about that. 400 years of silence. If you look in your Bible, in the Old Testament, you go to the very last word of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6. Do you know what it says? It says curse. And then 400 years of silence. Then, when you open up your Bible after that 400 years, at the beginning of the New Testament, in Matthew 1 and verse 1, what do we have? The blessing of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament ends in curse, but the New Testament begins with hope. It's all reignited because of the birth of Christ. The idea of prophecy reawakening hope is something to behold as we look at this text. Wise men come from the east, it says. They're made aware of something as Gentiles that just seems so stupendous to us. You'd think that this would be something that God would communicate to some Jewish person, and yet he communicates this to these Gentiles. And the Gentiles, the wise men, as they're referred to here, they see Jesus' star. It's Jesus' star. And they see it in the east, the text says. A newly created, miraculous, supernatural star. They see it. And they know that they need to follow this star to the country where Jesus was born. These wise men would arrive not at the night that he was born, but instead they would arrive two years after his birth to pay homage to this great king. So the birth of Jesus Christ, it provides us with both elements of hope and elements of humility. That's what we see in the text. And so this Lord's Day coincides with Christmas Eve 
And what I'd like to do is to understand the hope of Christmas through the eyes of these Gentile wise men that lived so long ago. And in order to do that, I'd like to ask four very important questions about these men. Number one, who are these wise men? Number two, who did they think that Jesus was? Number three, how did they find Jesus? And then number four, how did they respond to Jesus once they saw him? I think that once we understand the answers to these questions, and they're here in the text for us, then we're going to be in a better place to know how we can take what we know about this text and then really see it connect to our lives in the present so that we will be left with three transforming truths that will unfold for us along three lines of thought. These truths are faith. Number one, faith is established when we understand their story. Number two, hope it's buoyed or it's enlivened. And then number three, our lives are transformed as a result of studying this passage. Our lives are transformed as a result of studying the Word of God, period. And so we need to see that even when we're reading something so familiar and connecting with something that again and again and again. It's something that God wants to use in our lives right now. And so let's start with who the wise men are. Now the Greek word for the English term wise men, two words in English, only one word in Greek, it's magoi. We know the word as magi. We even use that word today. Well, the word developed from referring to a particular tribe of people to a sacred caste of people. And then it keeps developing. Words often do that historically through the process of time. It developed into something where the sacred caste began to use magical um, practices and when they began to use them then the word began to be understood as the word sorcerer and so when we get to Acts chapter 13 and verse 6 and Acts 13 and verse 8 we see the word magoi uh, being uh, translated as the word sorcerer now do you say well is that what these men were were they sorcerers no I think in Matthew's time when the book of Matthew was written, these men were wise men. I think it's a great translation. In other words, they were men who were learned, men that were very intellectual, and men who understood the sky. In other words, they studied the stars. And the text also tells us that they were from the east. Now, as far as the Bible is concerned, you're talking about the ancient Near East, so you're talking about the Far East. When when the, the Bible says that these men were from the east, it's referring most likely, we don't know this for sure, but educated guests, most likely these men, uh, and through tradition and other extra biblical reading, these men were from either Persia or from Babylon. So they were learned men, they understood the stars, they became expert at it. In other words, we could say that they were ancient Near Eastern astrologers. They interpreted the stars. They interpreted dreams. We know that this was something that uh, was kind of in place as far as Babylon's concerned just by reading the prophecy of Daniel, right? Nebuchadnezzar asked for his wise men to interpret the stars for, or to interpret the dreams for him. And of course, um, he received uh, revelation from God even as these wise men who may be from Babylon or from Persia, they received a revelation from God as well. So there's some there's some connection with, with what was happening in the prophecy of Daniel. The text says that they understand that they need to go to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Judea, so obviously they're going to go where this king is born. Uh, now, we're not told that they are Gentiles. Matthew doesn't say that they were, but most certainly they were coming from the east. And tradition tells us that there were three of them that came from the east. The reason why this is true is because they, there's a deduction, right? There's three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Therefore, the, the theory is that there must have been three wise men. But that's tradition. We don't know for sure how many there were. Uh, the text goes on to tell us uh, that these were wise men, but it doesn't tell us that they were kings. Sometimes we refer to them as kings because of tradition. Uh, probably not. 
They were wise men. They were intellectuals. They were not kings. So what we would say in order to answer this question, who are the wise men, the best that we can, we would say that they are ancient Near Eastern Gentile astrologers. They're given insight by God. They are to follow the star that belongs to Jesus to mark his birth. And they are moving according to the revelation given to them by God in much the same way that Nebuchadnezzar moved. So they were privileged in receiving this. So now that we know who they are, then we go to this next question, who did the wise men think Jesus was? Because this is a significant question as well. Our text clearly tells us that they thought that he was the king of the Jews. They come to Jerusalem to find out where Jesus was born. Notice that. That's an important detail. The wording of our text is, where is he who has born, been born king? Notice the text does not say, where is he who is going to be a king? But the text says, where is he who is born king? He is a king. It's not that he's going to be one, he is. Whether people acknowledge it or not, he is the eternal king of God. And so he had been born king. And while the text clearly states that he had been born king of the Jews, we also know that he came not only to fulfill the promise that was made to David, because he's appearing to these Gentiles, right? The star is and God is giving revelation. But he is also a king that will be the eternal king of kings. And we're kind of studying that in the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're given special insight. They don't ask who Jesus is. Instead, they ask, where is Jesus? Because we want to worship him. Now you say, well, how do they already know who Jesus is? And I'd have to answer that question by saying, I don't know for sure. I assume that God revealed it to them. That's what I assume, because they're very clearly right. I think that I, God revealed it to them as they received this, this idea of the star marking the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe as learned men, they understood the Old Testament because they would have been widely read. And the Old Testament would have been in Babylon. It would have been in Persia, because that's where Israel had been carried away into captivity. And so with all of that time in the Old Testament, it seems like these Gentile men knew the Old Testament better than some of the Jewish people that were living in Judea at the time. And I think that they would have understood a prophecy like Numbers 24 and verse 17. And here's what the Word of God says there. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumul. So I think the wise men then were ancient Near Eastern astrologers who know that Jesus is born king of the Jews. Not that he will be, but that he is born king of the Jews. And that leads us to the third question. How did the wise men find Jesus? Well, you say, Pastor O, you've already told us. They, they, they saw the star. And they followed it. That's true, but it bears repeating. God chose unlikely men to follow this star and, and, to, and to be a part of the greatest event in all of human history. These men followed Jesus' star. It's interesting, later in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 7, if you have your Bibles open to Matthew 2, Matthew 2 and verse 7, we learn that Herod had secret counsel. Uh, with the wise men to determine when Jesus' star had appeared. Now, why do you suppose he wants to know when Jesus' star had appeared? Well, he has nefarious reasons for that. The wise men don't know that yet, but he knows. And so Herod asked the wise men to go to Bethlehem, find this Jesus. And when you find him, then you come back and you bring word to me so that I might go and worship him also. But he's lying, right? He's being deceitful. You say, well, why, why would Herod want to kill this baby who would be born king of the Jews? Because he's king. And he doesn't want any contenders. You say, would he have been thinking Messiah? Probably not. I mean, he's a very base fellow. And he, he is not the kind of man that would be connected with spiritual things. Maybe 
as much as he needs to be in order to manipulate the people that he is governing, but that's it. He doesn't really have a spiritual perception. And so what happens in the text? Well, the wise men are warned uh, about what is going to happen through, through an angel. God is working. God is revealing this to them. And not only that, the wise men go another way and they don't go back to Herod, giving time to Joseph and Mary and the Lord Jesus to escape to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod. So infuriated that the wise men have kind of duped him, the text goes on to tell us that he puts to death all male children in Bethlehem and all the districts that surround Bethlehem. So we're not just talking about Bethlehem, but the districts surrounding Bethlehem. And verse 16 states that the children were two years old and under. And so he based this putting to death all male children two years and under, he based this on what he had received from the wise men. That's difficult, but that's exactly what happened. This is spoken in fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah 31 and verse 15, which says this, and you might want to follow verse 16. You can see how closely Jeremiah 31, 15 aligns with this verse. It says, A voice was heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. So almost verbatim, right? So we look at this text and we say, how did the wise men find Jesus? Well, anyone studying the passage would come to this idea, if I'm a believer, if I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior, I'm going to conclude that everything was supernaturally revealed to them by God himself. And they followed what God had revealed to them. And that's all God asks us to do, but he has revealed so much more to us. They're directed by a miraculous star. And even all of what they do is confirmed in the bloody events that occur in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. But this leads us then to a final question, and that is, how did the wise men uh, respond to Jesus once they uh, found him? How did they respond to Jesus once they found him? So that, that question there that I have on the slide is not, let's see, that's not right. <laughs> but how did they respond? Of course, the Bible says uh, that they worshiped him. That's the simple answer. I mean, that's what it says. The star which they had uh, witness rise in the east that they understood to be the star of Jesus appeared to them again. So evidently they knew that it beckoned them to Judea and then at some point it appears to them again and the text tells us it guided them to the home where the young child was. It doesn't say it guided them to the manger, right? But to the home where the young child was. And they entered the house that night and they found the young child. In other words, they didn't find a baby, but they found a young two-year-old with his mother, and then they fell down and they worshipped him in Matthew 2 and verse 11. They opened their treasures of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I think that these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh speak of the kingly nature of the Lord Jesus. In other words, when I look at these gifts, I know that they're costly. I know that they're precious. I know that they're luxury items. And these men gave those gifts to Jesus because they recognized who he was. It's kind of similar to the act of uh, anointing his feet uh, or anointing him for burial as Mary did when he was still alive. That kind of devotion, that, that kind of idea of taking something that is worth so much and, and giving it to the Lord Jesus. Well, there are a lot of lessons that we can derive from that. Sometimes people will want to attach significant importance to each gift or maybe speak of the stages of Jesus' life through each gift, but I don't know anything for sure other than what the Bible has revealed to me. And so, because the Bible is silent as far as the significance of the gifts are concerned, all I can say is that they were very, very costly, they were very, very precious, and these men were willing to give these gifts to Jesus because Jesus is precious. He is our king. 
and we need to worship him. So the wise men worshiped Jesus. They counted him worthy. That's what the idea of worship is. We count him worthy of the greatest honor ever bestowed upon anyone. That is, he is God, very God himself. And they fall down on their face. In, in ancient Near Eastern pra practices, uh, people would have uh, looked to their king as someone to worship. They would have fell down. I mean, we see that with Nebuchadnezzar, right? They, 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 people had to fall down and even worship his image. So in the ancient Near East, they would have done that and they would have counted their king as deity. Okay, we see that a lot with Egypt and Pharaoh, right? So the idea is very, very much present in the minds of these men. They're accustomed to it, but they, because of the revelation of God, they count Jesus as the great king of kings. They look to him as the son of God or God the son and they worship him. That's amazing. So we've asked four questions and hopefully we've answered them uh, today. The wise men are ancient Near Eastern astrologers. They believe that Jesus was born king of the Jews. They find him because of the supernatural revelation of God and once they do, they worship him as deity. They worship him as God. Now that leads us to great wisdom ourselves. In other words, what this is going to do, the events that happened in the past are going to drive our present understanding of who Jesus is. And as they do, we start to see faith built in our own lives. We start to see hope bolstered, enlivened in our lives. And then our lives are transformed because you don't go forward in life unless faith, hope, and love are present in life. And so we need to be well aware of what God is doing. Let's look at this first transforming truth, and that is faith is established. God is establishing faith through this story that happened over 2,000 years ago. It's just not a, a, a warm-hearted story. It, it's not something that we look at traditionally and, and forget, but it's something to be remembered. It's something to be dwelt upon. So the events that I read in Matthew 2 strengthen me. They strengthen my faith. They strengthen my inner man. That's the idea. The wise men themselves, they're not reading these events, right? They are receiving a physical witness when it comes to the Lord Jesus. They see him with their eyes. They see him even though we haven't seen him physically, right? We, we find joy in this passage even though it contains elements of great humility concerning Jesus. We find joy in this passage even in the face of Herod's murderous and barbaric actions. We find joy even in the face of Jewish apathy when it comes to receiving Jesus as king. The wise men say in the passage, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. They saw his star. They saw it. They saw the young child. They saw him in that crude home in, in Bethlehem. They saw him. That, that's what's so amazing about this. They, they fell before him physically. They fell down on their faces before him. And they counted him worthy as God. So there is no doubt in these men. Everything is unfolding in the way God has revealed it to them. And so they have great faith. And we're supposed to read this text and we're supposed to worship him in the same way as if we were standing with the wise men falling down and worshiping him. And we should do that not on the basis of their word, but on the basis of God's word. God's word to us through them. He directs them to go another way. The, the Bible tells us that when they do, uh, they're, 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 they're leaving to their own country without speaking to Herod. So Herod doesn't get that information, right? He doesn't want it. He doesn't desire it at all, even though he claims to be the king of the Jews. They give Joseph, Mary, and, and the Lord Jesus, the, the, the toddler, the Lord Jesus, time to leave the place where they're at and to go to Egypt. And there they will find security. I think that's interesting when you consider redemption, how God led Israel out of Egypt, right? To redeem them, to save them. And that fits well with Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, the next prophecy fulfilled in the text. 
In Hosea 11 and verse 1, here's what the Bible says. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. This is the prophecy that was fulfilled in the book of Matthew. You say, yeah, but that's not talking about the Lord Jesus. It's talking about Israel. It is. There is a dual focus so obvious in this prophecy that we can't miss it. In other words, yes, there was a time when God called uh, Israel out of Egypt and, and there was this birth of this nation as they wandered into the wilderness and then into the promised land later and then the development of their history. But God also will call out of Egypt his son and he will bring him into the land and Jesus will give to the people the good news of the gospel. Of course, they will reject him, but he will do this knowing full well that he will be rejected. I think if we fail to see God's hand in all of this and how all of it is connected together, then we are the ones that should be pitiable people. We're the, we're the Jewish apathetic people who don't care about the real meaning of Christmas, right? There are so many people that are walking around today and they're like Herod. They're concerned about keeping their power. They're concerned about keeping their possessions. They're concerned about keeping everything going in this present life. And they miss the whole meaning of Christmas, that God had sent his son to die for their sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God holds out his arms today, and he is inviting us. It's, a, it's as clear as if there were a star, a miraculous star in front of us. We don't see this physical star, but we see the light that is in the world today. And the light of the world is Jesus. And we look to him. It's just amazing when you see parallels like that. So do we understand then that even today... Wise men still seek him. Second, not only is faith established, but hope is enlivened. Hope shines brightest, but it shines brightest in the darkest of places in the ancient Near East. I mean, that's where it begins. That's where the hope begins. It reminds me of Abraham because that's where Abraham was. That's where he started out in Ur of the Chaldees. And God called him out of that darkness to be uh, the father of the Jews, to have all of these descendants come from him. And we, we are the ones who exercise the same faith as Abraham. And that is how we are following in his line as well. It's just all so amazing when you think about it. And so God's bright star of hope penetrates this very dark place very hardened hearts and the wise men who grew up in a very hopeless background the most hopeless that i could conceive of at the particular time in which uh, all of this takes place they get all of the hope from god and they act upon that hope boy if i'm in a dark place and i receive that kind of hope i'm going to act upon it and they do nothing is too hard for god Instead, the kingdoms of this world, as, as the Revelation tells us, the kingdoms of this world and of his Christ shall be established forever and ever. And he will reign forever and ever. So it shall be as he revealed. Hope is enlivened. And then third, lives are transformed. They're transformed along three lines of thought. The first is learning provides a foundation to apprehend spiritual truth. These were wise men, after all. Do you know that there are some churches today, thankfully not in this church, but there are some churches today that, that any kind of education is looked at um, with uh, skepticism by people. There is this reverse pride that happens. Yeah, I don't have an education because an education, uh, you know, you're allowing other people to think for you. That's not, that, that's fear speaking. When people talk like that, that's fear speaking. When we get an education, we're able to think for ourselves. We're able to study for ourselves. We're able to learn for ourselves. It's liberating to be educated. You say, well, there could be pride. You know, there could be this intellectual snobbery and people looking down on people who don't have education. Yeah, that exists too. But there is also the other end of the spectrum where people say I distrust all forms of education but these wise men they were learned men 
And they knew. They knew their stuff. They learned. And God used their learning to reveal himself to them. And God will do the same thing for us today. If we have the opportunity to learn and we fail to exercise that opportunity, then we are not wise stewards of the gifts that God has given to us. And it's all because of fear that incapacitates us. We should get all the learning that we can so that we can understand God. Don't fear knowledge because knowledge is the point of transformation for so many people, just as it was for these wise men. Number two, obstacles are overcome by those who seek the Lord Jesus in all earnest. Even as the wise men found him, we can find him today. You say, well, nobody seeks God. Well, that's true until God begins to work. And when God works and we respond to him, we're seeking him. And, and the Bible tells us, ask, seek, and knock. So that's what I'm going to do. You say, well, God is causing you to do that. Great. I'm glad he is. And I, and I hope he's causing you to do that too. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking because that's what these wise men did. We find in all of the additional revelation of the New Testament, illumined by the Holy Spirit, so much more than the wise men had. So much more. It's like this banquet that's open before us every day. And what do we do with it? How we've grown cold and apathetic to the truths of Scripture. And they should be transforming our lives. That's why we should read through our Bible in a year. Not read through it to check off boxes, but to read through it to change. To see some transformation go on in our lives. God is able to bring us through. And, and when I look at my Bible, I need to look at it in the same way that the wise men looked at what they were given. I need to find Jesus because I know who he is. Now I need to find him. Where is he? I want him present in my life at all times. That's why I, I so enjoyed that book um, by the author is Brother Lawrence, kind of strange, but practicing the presence. Knowing that Jesus is present with us, knowing that he is walking with us, even while we're doing menial tasks, he is there. We look to him. And then number three, finally this morning, once we find him, what should we do? We should do what the wise men did. We should worship him. We should count him worthy of all praise. We should see him as the great God of all. The Son of God, yes, but God the Son. And he is worthy of worship. Everything from with me, within me, my body and soul, it's just a reasonable service to put it all on the altar for him. And when I get off the altar and start to spend and be spent for my own selfish purposes, to repent and to turn away from that and get back on the altar again and to be used of God. Don't give in. Don't give in to the mold of this world. Don't be conformed by it, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in the word of God. That's the hope of Christmas. If we do not worship him as completely, as God, very God himself, then do you know what will happen? The wise men will rise up one day and chastise us for not being what we should have been. Imagine that. And they didn't have the revelation that you and I have. That's amazing. They honored him as deity, a young child in a humble place. And how much more should we worship him as the great king of kings and lord of lords that we know he is? Let's pray together.